It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Let's get real. It was actually just the worst of times. Welcome to the Teach Bigger Podcast. I am Tyler Lamond. I am Chris Mosley. Hey, I'm Chris Pratt, and this is episode two of season three. And today we're going to be talking about four main points for your first few weeks of starting remote learning. We're going to be talking about engagement, appropriate assignments, preparedness slash uh, planning, and assessments. So why don't you take it away, Mosley? We'll just, we'll just jump right into it. So <laughs> it, as far as engagement goes, you know, I and this whole process started like in the spring whenever we were forced into it, <laughs> into the pool. Um I just try to make the the virtual classroom feel as much as possible, like, you know, face to face. Um, so kind of without intention, I just started doing certain things um, to help it. Um, first thing I did was make sure everyone has their camera on, <laughs> you know, and I said, listen, I want to see your face. I know you want to see mine. And they kind of like, you know, whatever. Uh, I want to make this feel as much as a, face-to-face -face classroom as possible. I feed off of your body language, you nodding, you, you know, like that. I said, mm -hmm. think if, think if I were teaching you and you could see my face and I like covered up the screen and they all laughed. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, you, it's like, it's like me teaching you face to face and I have like a sheet over my face. You see how weird that is? And they're like, yeah. So please make sure you have your camera on. I told them, you know, I'm used to your, your funny looking face in person. So I'll, I'll it's the same thing, you know? And it kind of like, they kind of understood, but um, first to make sure their cameras always on and I can see them. Um, and then, well, and, another, and here's the thing, yeah. mostly, I think this is one of the big questions that most teachers are facing right now, because a lot of folks that are doing remote learning, it's like, I put together my lesson, I have my, my stuff, but the kids, they just aren't doing the work, you know, or they're not showing up, they're mm -hmm. ghosting, they're doing whatever. And this is like, the big question is how do you get kids engaged? Right. And so I think mostly what you're saying is so important because it's about making sure that your online classroom is an extension of the culture that you mm. would build in a regular classroom. And mm. things are gonna be different. And I think it's important that you explain that to kids. Like, this is different. Like, you're looking at my house or, you know, whatever. Like, I can see your, your house, whatever. Things are different, but we have our norms. We have our culture that yeah. we're gonna build. And so I think establishing those norms are really important. And, and you know, as adults, we do that without um any worries like you know an, an adult meeting we don't have any problem saying like hey make sure your cameras are on whatever but we have mm -hmm. to extend that to the kids as well i think a lot of times like i'll be honest a lot of times i think with kids it is awkward because you, you there's a part of me as a teacher that i don't want to look in your bedroom <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. so it's like you're there i don't want to see you in your bedroom like right that. Yeah. exactly so yeah. so there's a part of me that i might go like well you know i don't really care if your camera's not on because i don't I don't, yeah. it's awkward, but I think yeah. we have to help our kids understand how to set up an environment to where we can function properly without. Yeah, we talk about that too. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and we don't want to let them off the hook per se, just because the situation has changed. You know, mm -hmm. look, here's the thing. Colleges have been doing remote learning for a long time now. Right. And yeah. I would venture to say that many people listening to this podcast right now, you got your master's degree online. And that was not a weird situation. It didn't have to be strange. Like you did what you did because that's the way it was set up. But now, you know, I say, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, I don't know how much real face to face time did like that online, online colleges do do. I know they do a lot of like, you know, discussions and all that stuff like that do, do they do like the real like the face-to-face -face like we do like we're doing now on it occasion was a lot of that. i don't know uh, whenever i did mine it, it was on occasion in other words like it wasn't on a daily basis by any stretch of the means uh, we did yeah. have a weekly meeting but usually cameras were off and you would watch the instructor yeah see, that's what i'm saying right. I, I didn't know if it was like right. the i see you you see me i'm giving you instruction right away but it was more like i posted this on your online portal go there mm -hmm. we have a discussion you turn it in 
I don't see you. You know what I'm saying? Well, and that definitely happens. But there were definitely times within each course or semester or whatever where there was some sort of a meeting or a project where you had to collaborate either with your professor or with other students. And so it, it was never weird. And I think that the reason it was <clears throat> never weird was because the understanding and the expectation was this is how we do things. You know, mm -hmm. and so like as a student in that environment, I would find a quiet place. I would make sure that everything looked appropriate and I would I would do it. And, and it was the same thing. And it, it never seemed strange. So mm -hmm. I think that we have to make it a norm for our students to understand, like, here's how you do it. And maybe it's a it's a matter of as you set up your class, you teach them how to set up their workstation. Like, you know, make sure that, you know there's not you're not in the middle of this or that and and like help them mm -hmm. understand what are best practices yeah like sitting yeah. in your bed with your covers on is not a best yeah. practice <laughs> and me seeing like, like half your face i always say something about that i was like i only see half your face i can't see that and you know whenever you're here in front of me so show me like you know just just so they understand i see you and this is what i want you know right now let, let me kind of throw in a little wrench with this because i i, I came up with and we talked about a little bit in season two these 10 etiquette rules or whatever and then when i started school i actually knocked it down to eight and i think it even went down to seven mm -hmm. uh but i put on there uh it, it was originally like you must have your camera on well my administration came to me and then i even had a student too said that you can't demand that a kid have their their camera on and especially where my in my district where there's uh, a lot of poverty they i had at least two students who they were embarrassed to have a background on like that that was they didn't want people to see what kind of a mess or whatever it is of where they they lived right. so i changed it to be uh if you had the ability to then you can have it on. And then also at the same time, since uh, I live more in a rural area, uh, not a lot of people had a, a strong enough signal. Mm -hmm. So like mostly do you like, what would you do or what would you suggest for people who have like that type of issue where maybe it's not possible or not practical for them to have uh, a camera on? Well, you know, the, uh, that, that kind of was presented also. Um, an, an option that they gave was like, I know on Zoom, you can do a virtual background mm -hmm. and then it kind of blocks out mm -hmm. everything that's behind you. So, I mean, that that is an option, you know, but I haven't had any issues like that so far. But I mean, I guess that's kind of a a one to one type of thing, you know. Yeah, but that, that's what I was thinking. Usually, just like find somewhere like, you know, because some of my kids, they'll go outside like they'll do this stuff outside. And, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and we just kind of had that culture of like, hey, you, you are where you are, you know, where we're all of this together. It doesn't matter where you are, as long as you can have a spot for your, yourself and be able to, you know, so mm -hmm. go outside, see if you have a virtual background, maybe tell them like find a small space and put something up, you know, like talk to them and try to talk them through how to set up an area that, you know, is comfortable for them. Let reassure them like, Hey, we're all in this together. We're, you know, adjusting and we're not judging on what's mm -hmm. going on in the background, you know, something like that. My, my assumption yeah. is that that would not be the norm, you know, that you're going to yeah. have the majority of kids are going to be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think you would handle that just like you would in any situation in the classroom. And it might be a matter of like, hey, if you feel uncomfortable or you don't think mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to have a camera on, like, I want you to email me. I want you and I to have a one on one, you know, conference. And let me help you come up with a, a solution. Let's troubleshoot yeah. this together. And then as a teacher, you might find out, you know what, this is a bad situation and the kid really does need to keep their camera off. And then you can make a concession for that student. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I yeah. think it's, it's, probably, you know, it's, probably, it's probably the minority on that. Most kids, they, and if they don't have the camera on just because they're being weird. So, you know, like, yeah. right. I don't want to, you know, see my face or whatever. But if it's, I think if it's a true issue, if you have a good relationship with a the kid, then they would probably reach out to you anyway, and then you can help them come up with a problem, you know, a solution. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. I just wanted to bring that up because no, but was, it, it has been it has been brought up before. You know, yeah, like this might happen. So yeah, yeah. Um, so what else do you do? Yeah, so I also do this every day. Like when they, when they first get on, I just I look at all of my squares and I make sure <laughs> <laughs> I make sure to like say every kid's name. I'm like, hey, Tyler. How's it going? I see you. Da, 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 da. I'll say something toward them. 
hey, Chris, I see that you have on the same shirt that you had on for the last three weeks. <laughs> no, I won't say that, but, you know, I say something to them. And then if I, you know, like if I see their hair is different or something like that, I'll just go and say, hello, Mr. Lamont or hello, something, something every single like every single day, every single class. And if I if I miss a name at the beginning or something like that, I'll just say, oh, hey, blah, 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 their name. Hey, Johnny. And they're like they just light up like even if I got in the class too late. Um, I make sure to acknowledge them so they know like, hey, I know, you know, it's a lot of people, but I see you. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm acknowledging you, you know, because, you know, when you're on like a class and you have like 30, like my virtual classes range from like 20 to 30, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so they know how that is. So they, they kind of feel like I'm almost like hidden almost. I make sure every single time to say something. And if they do something on there that's funny, I acknowledge it usually pretty quickly. You know, uh, so they know that, hey, he can see me and we're still interacting. So, you know, well, would I do you, that every, every class, I do that every single class. Would you say that that is like the equivalent to like if I was in my normal classroom face to face, like greeting them at the door and mm-hmm. saying hello to them yes. or, or circling the room and like and maybe saying something like, you know, doing that little, you kind of touch the back of their chair and say like, Oh, that's yeah. really smart or something like uh-huh. that. Right. I, it's, and it's kind of like, cause I know a lot of times whenever like my kids come in, I'll, I'll, I'll say hello sometimes, but I always give them like a, like a nod, like, mm-hmm. like I see you, you know, like right. that. And so this is a way for me to give them like, Hey, I see that you're here today. Got you. You know, well, I, I love what you guys are saying. Cause I think that is so important because you know, a best practice for sure is greeting students at the door. And if that's something that maybe you haven't really done in the past, I would encourage you to try that. Like it will totally change the culture and the dynamic of your class. If you stand at the door and greet the kids as they come in. And it also increases engagement just in general, right? Because suddenly there is that personal connection on a daily basis. And it kind of helps you feel the, the pulse of the, the class and the temperature, like, you know, as a kid having a bad day or whatever, like when you have that interaction with them, if it's a kid that usually smiles at you or says hi, and then they come in and they like, you know, have a pout on their face or whatever, you might know like, okay, maybe we need to look at this. And it's no different in your virtual classroom. You need to greet the kids at the door. Like whenever they come on, then it's like, greetings, hello, you yeah. as a person, I'm glad you're here in our classroom today. And then you move forward. And so uh, really, I think a lot of times teachers are freaking out about virtual instruction, remote instruction, and they're going like, well, I don't know what to do or what do we need to do? Nobody told me what to do. It's just like teaching in a real classroom. Best practice is a best practice. If it works in the real classroom, all we have to do is figure out how do we put it into a remote environment. And I get it. There are limitations. There are some things you just can't do. Mm-hmm. But there are also things you can do in a remote environment that you can't do in a real face-to-face environment. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to weigh out the good with the bad and we've got to figure out what works. Yeah. So, um, Tyler, tell me some things you do to keep your kids engaged. So one of the big things that I did, cause I had a huge problem and I'm sure everyone did with this, uh, with getting kids to just log on, to just log on to the actual thing, to the actual Google meet or zoom or whatever. And then I also had, and still am having to, in a certain extent, although it's way better with kids turning in assignments, just mm-hmm. actually doing the work or turning them in and all this. So what I did is, um, I made phone calls at the end of the first week. Mm-hmm. I tallied everybody who had, uh, I think, cause I, by the end of the first week I had two grades and if you were missing one or, or all of them and you hadn't logged in at all, I called you and look, I know that you're Marley saying like, man, I have like a hundred kids, 200 kids. That's a lot. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It was a lot, but mm-hmm. guess what? I called every single home and I would say I probably got about 75% of those parents to pick up. And it took about an hour, I guess. I'm not entirely sure, but it did take some time. And the next week, my attendance skyrocketed with just people who were coming in. And then at the end of that week, I called again. And, I, and I'm and i doing that constantly at the end of every week just to touch base to see if it was a kid who like maybe they're lying to their parents saying like, oh, yeah, I'm logging on. I'm doing all my work. And in real reality, they're not. And the parent doesn't know any different, you know. Or maybe it's a technology issue. Maybe like their computer broke. I had one kid who their parents went out and bought them like this really high end laptop. And the second week he spilt water on it and fried it. Uh, So like now he's totally screwed for school. That's why we can't have nice things. That's exactly (laughs) why. (laughs) 
So, call, you know, and, but I would never have known that if I wouldn't have reached out to the parent because the parent yeah. told me what was going on and that I was able to redirect them to the school for them to get the technology that they needed. Um, right. So, so like point in case, best practice, right? Communicate, communicate with parents, communicate with students. When a kid's best, not, pra best practice, don't give your kids nice things. <laughs> right. So like whenever, whenever your students are struggling or they're not doing what they need to do in a face-to-face -face class, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What should you do? You should call the parents. You should talk one-on-one -on -one with the student. It doesn't change in the virtual classroom. I can't tell you how many people I sit back and I'm listening to them and teachers are like, well, I just can't get them. I can't get them to log on. Well, have you called anybody? Well, no. Okay, well, maybe that's why they're not logging on. <laughs> like, call their mom. Call their yeah. mom. Kids don't want to get in trouble for the most part. There's always exceptions. Some of them don't care. But most kids don't want to get in trouble by their parents. So call Look, their parents, right? And I, I don't think that a lot of these kids are – like, I don't think they have it fathomed in their brain that when they turn something in online, it's there for, like – ever yeah. like i mean it's not out there for the public obviously yeah. but like i had this one student uh they turned in uh some type of video and it was very obvious that they did not want to do it and they were like they said a whole bunch of stuff that they probably shouldn't have said <laughs> especially to their teacher so i downloaded the video and i or no i didn't download it i uh sent it to the parent Right. Like, I don't think that they realize that, like, you can't say, like, you wouldn't have been able to say that in my classroom. So saying it in a video that is now recorded, like, you can't deny that you didn't do that. <laughs> I have it on video that wow. you did it. Like, it's right there. That's so, special. I like remote <laughs> learning. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh, buddy. Yeah. So, so, I mean, engagement, like, you know, that that is the thing. Everyone's wondering, how do we increase engagement? How do we keep the kids involved? And I think making those personal contacts for sure, making sure that you are, have a good line of communication and the expectations are clear, you know, mm -hmm. I, for me, an what interesting thing about engagement was this. I don't know, necessarily think that I did something really special, but what I we just, know you, we know you don't do special things. <laughs> right. Exactly. You have to be special to do special. <laughs> right. Go so ahead. no, but I, I just found it interesting because my district, we did something really unique. Like we were going to do three weeks of remote learning and then we were planning to bring all the kids back on campus, mm -hmm. um, you know, after those three weeks provided that the conditions were good. Well, um, about, I don't know, five or six classroom days in, um, our superintendent decided that conditions looked good. Let's bring them all back. So I didn't have very much remote learning. And then suddenly we were all back face to face. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> hey, look, everybody's okay. We're, we're doing okay. But that being said, I did in that short amount of time notice uh, an interesting trend. And it was this, that whenever I produced um, online content for the kids in the classroom, you almost might want to call it like flipped instruction, right? that my kids had better retention of the content than when I got back face to face and taught like normal. Now, I don't know what that says. Does that say that I'm a pretty entertaining online personality? Does that say I'm really boring Definitely in class? <laughs> right. I would, I would disagree. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're boring both in class and yeah. online. That's I don't true. know. <laughs> but what I discovered was this, that there was way more retention whenever I did flipped instruction and I did like video lessons that were pre-recorded than when I just teach a normal class. So I don't know if that was because kids had the ability to go back and rewatch. I think mm -hmm. that may have something to do with it, but I also think it had to do with the style and the way that I did it. I think that it became more entertainment than just information. So I think that engagement is such an important part of what we're doing in remote learning because if you don't just like in a regular classroom if you don't have engagement kids aren't learning and so mm -hmm. we have a unique tool set in front of us with virtual learning that we can engage them in different ways so i think that it's going to be really important as you know as teachers really think through this engagement piece that they're really thinking about what can i use and how can i do it and experiment and see what works for your kids. So, I mean, my advice would be, don't be afraid to experiment and see what's working. Don't feel like you have to fit into a certain mold and just do A, B, or C. Like, try new things and see what happens, so. Yeah. 
Okay. You know, well, another another thing that I do, and this will be the last thing. Another thing that I do is on on Zoom. There's a breakout session. Mm-hmm. It's like real time, and if we're working on music or something like that, I'll go um, and I'll like divide it up. And it's it's kind of tricky, but just because you're gonna have to. Like, I think I think you you can do it ahead of time, but I do it like like in the room, you know. So like I talk to them, and I'm like, okay. We're going to break off and then I'll break them off into different groups and then I'll send them out to the breakout rooms <clears throat> and then I'll jump back from room to room. And then so and some of my classes, like my top classes, I have like leaders. Um, mm-hmm. And when I jump out of that session, they take over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this constant like feedback and stuff like that. So what I usually do is if we're working on something, I'll have them demonstrate first or play and I get the feedback. Then after that, and I jump out of the room, they take over, and then they'll get they're giving feedback as I jump back and forth. Um, and of course, your kids you have to have the culture for that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and my kids are, you know, mature and respond, you know, respond to that. Like, um, but that is something I do, and you know, that that makes the classroom even smaller. So I know like I can say everybody's name and everyone's accountable and everyone's playing and stuff like that, even if I'm you know in and out. So it de- it depends on the level that you teach, it depends on the culture that you have already with the kids um you know but you can use the breakout feature in, in many different ways but that's kind of a way of just breaking your kids up into small groups online mm-hmm. i i really feel like that has worked a lot i would even say that that would probably be one of the aspects where a virtual is probably better because there's probably a, a lot of teachers who like they probably want to do breakout sessions or whatever in face to face, but they might not. Their class size might be too big and their room might be too small and they're not able to do that. When you're doing a virtual thing, it doesn't matter how big your, your class. Well, I mean, it does, but it doesn't in terms of space. You know what I'm saying? Like you can still do breakout rooms compared to if you're face to face and the room is too small or something like that, you know? Mm hmm. Yep, that's good. Yep. Okay, so engagement obviously is going to be one of the major foundations of setting up your virtual classroom and getting mm-hmm. prepared for that. So, you know, as you're planning your remote lessons, you've got to think about that engagement factor. But then also, it's really important that you begin to think about appropriate assignments. Okay, because mm-hmm. an assignment face to face sometimes is going to look very different than a virtual assignment. Um, mm-hmm. Also, you know, you have to be careful that your virtual assignments don't become busy work, but they become effective, that there's a clear understanding of what the whole point of giving a virtual assignment is so that you know what kids know. So if I'm introducing material, I'm introducing content, then I need to plan my activities, my assignments to give me the feedback to understand what they know or what they don't know so that I can get them to the to the ultimate goal. Okay. So whenever we're thinking about appropriate assignments, you know, let's, let's take a minute and dive in and say like, what is a good, um, thought process in planning those, assi- those assignments? Well, one, one of the things that has, that I've noticed because now I'm in, I, you know, I'm in a new role now and teaching media and I kind of feel like a, a brand new teacher again, because I'm teaching a content that I haven't been doing my whole life. Uh, but that happens to a lot of teachers. There are a lot of teachers who maybe they got a math degree and for whatever reason, they end up teaching science or reading or, or, you know, computer or something like that. So, you know, that's a very common thing to happen. But when I was teaching, uh, especially these last like few weeks, I noticed that I had to be very careful with how I introduced new material. So what I would do was, um, I did, I would do like a, my first lesson or the beginning of the week. So like on Monday, I would say like 90% of it was stuff that they already knew. And then there was a dash of something new. And then the next day, I would do another assignment or another discussion or another, I would introduce something else. And now the ratio became like, I don't know, 60%. And then it was 40% something new. And I just kind of went through this until by the end of the week, the ratio had completely flipped. And maybe it was like 10% of uh, something that they had already known. And then it was like 90% of something new. And then the next week built on to on to that. So uh, which I felt was a little bit, uh, different because I felt, I feel like when I'm face to face, I'm able to give them a lot more new information, 
you know, because I'm there to engage them or whatever. Whereas in when they're online, that a lot of that engagement, a lot of that inner drive has to come from just that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important thing to think about when you're making an appropriate assignment is really rely on what they already know to, and to present something that they don't know. So using stuff that you know, in order to find stuff that you don't know. Mm, yeah. I like that. That I makes like sense. That. Yeah. 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 So it's the kind of same thing that, that I do. Like we see a certain group of class on a certain day. So when we go to give assignments, the days that they haven't seen this yet, they are just kind of building on what they already know. You know, I don't, and I don't make their assignments due until after they've had a real, you know, like a class session where we can build on the, the skills that they, or give them new information so they can turn in their assignments pretty much. So um, I'm just aware when planning uh, what days that their class is coming because all classes don't come on all days for us. We, I literally yeah. like live by a schedule. I don't have it memorized. I look at it and say, oh, okay, th that today, you know? Yes, that's uh, exactly how I am too. Exactly. Yeah, because it, <laughs> every class is on different days and, you know, so. Uh, but I, and when, when I plan, I just say, okay, they won't be coming this day. So their, their assignment, you know, um, asynchronous is to work on this, blah, 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 mm -hmm. you know? And then after they come, they have either assignment due or they're 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 given something that has new information in it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just I just aware of the, the the day they come and then I don't si assign things until they've they've had time with me. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm going to suggest this. You know, if you're you know jotting down notes or whatever. Okay. I I really truly think that one of the things you have to keep in mind when you're planning your assignments is this: that you don't approach these assignments with this attitude. Okay. I'm sure that in a few weeks, remote learning is going to go away. No, it's not right. Like <laughs> I, I really <laughs> truly feel like there's a lot of teachers that are like just hanging in there. If I can get till September this or whatever, like surely we're going to shut this down and we're not gonna have to do this anymore. And that's really dictating how you make your assignments. Yeah. And Cause that means you're just, you're coasting. You're trying to, you're, you're trying to just get by. Gotta make it, that's what we're doing in the spring. <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah. listen, think about it for a second though. Uh, like yeah. if that is your mentality and maybe you're right, but if that's your mentality, then I'm doing, I am doing assignments to meet a quota. Like I'm doing assignments because they said we have to have three grades and, and I've got to have three grades a week. So then I guess I'll do a Google quiz and then I'm going to do a, you know, and so you're just trying to meet standard, right? Instead of saying, what do my kids need to experience to understand the content? So I think we have to be careful that we don't approach online learning like, I hope this goes away soon. Because if that's our approach, we're likely to build assignments that the kids are going to hope go away soon. But if mm -hmm. your approach is, here I am doing remote learning and guess what, whether I'm face to face or not, this is going to get them where they need to be. And what I would really encourage people to start considering is doing flipped instruction, right? Like think if you came back face to face tomorrow, which some people have and some people haven't, but if you did, how could you still use remote learning in a way? Like how could you use online content to drive your kids to a higher level in your content? Like what kind of flipped instruction can you do? And I think when you start approaching it that way, not I have to do this, but this is a tool for me, then suddenly I can start making more effective. We've got to think about the student experience. Like it can't be, I did what they said to do. Uh -huh. Like if you're approaching online learning and you're like, well, I did what admin told me I had to do, check. Uh -huh. Like I have my three assignments, I did my you know quiz, I did whatever, I did my attendance check, I feel sorry for kids that have to deal yeah, with that. Ultimately what you're doing is you're wasting time. Yeah. Like you're, I mean, like as of right now, my school has been back for five or six weeks. Mm -hmm. So if I would have had that mentality, I would have wasted almost or more than half of a, uh, of a nine week period. If you're on nine weeks, if you're on a six week period, you've almost wasted an entire six week period. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can't have that mentality because like, I mean, what if the worst happens and we go back to fully remote again? Like you don't know. And 
you don't know what you don't know. So you just have to prepare and teach like this is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. And and when did we wake up and, and decide as an educational community that remote learning is bad? <laughs> I mean, I just feel like I'm around a lot of teachers who just have this like disgruntled look on their face a lot because I have to do remote learning. Well, they had they had that look on their face before remote learning. You probably didn't recognize it. <laughs> well, maybe so. well, okay, I'll play a little devil advocate with that. Mm -hmm. I think people have a bad taste in their mouth with remote learning for two reasons. One, I think it's because we're it, uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's it's also because it went so bad in the spring. Yeah, because nobody knew what we were. I mean, we didn't even know what we were doing. We were barely holding on, just like right. everybody else. And know? I get it. The struggle is real. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but what I'm saying is as a, as an effective educator, we have to get past our frustrations and we have to say, but I can do this, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I'll say the second reason why I think people have a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to remote learning is that, and this is totally a personal belief. I believe that you can only educate somebody so much solely just through online. Mm -hmm. And you can only educate somebody so much solely through just face to face. Mm -hmm. I think that if you want to get the maximum amount of engagement and the maximum amount of like actual learning and retention, you have to use a balance between both a face to face and technology. You can't just go all one and the other. Now you might be more comfortable with face to face because that's how like all of history has been when it comes to teaching or whatever. But now it, you can do so many more things that are more engaging if you balance it out and that's one of the things that happened with like you know canvas and schoology and blackboard or whatever is everybody jumped on it mm -hmm. but those programs aren't designed to be fully 100 percent online they're designed to be a either hybrid. a supplement a hybrid. or a hybrid mm -hmm. or something like that, which is one of the reasons why a lot of things were failing and, and we were experiencing so, so many problems. Now, I, I think that a lot of those uh, programs have really risen to the challenge and like they've actually become really, really good because mm -hmm. of it because, you know, that's what we do right. as just people in general. But I, I think that's what it was is that the spring went bad because nobody knew what to do. And then two is that uh, we are used to face-to-face -to -face, and the best way to do anything is to do a hybrid blend of technology and face-to-face -face. so i want to i want to throw this thought out there to the mm -hmm. to the listeners and to the community right i, I want to think about this you know a lot of us for a long time we've been frustrated and it, i don't want to use the word complaining because it's not really complaining but we've had a lot of conversation you know in different educational groups about like the industrial model of school and how we don't like it and how you know, school as we know it was set up in the industrial revolution and it's basically just creating factory workers and kids don't really think for themselves and they don't have any kind of, um, you know, collabor collaborative skills and they just come and the bells ring and then they go to the bathroom and then they come to school and don't talk and this and that. And so we all kind of get frustrated with that and we're always saying, let's change the model, let's change the model. And if you think about it, like how long would it or will it take us to change that model? Like conceivably a long time, okay? However, COVID happened, and now the model changed whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. So now we have this opportunity to really change the model, but a lot of times I think we go back to, we just want it the way it used to be. But really we don't yeah. want it the way it used to be because we didn't like that to begin with. So I think we've got to take the hand we were dealt, and it was remote, right? Like everybody's got to stay home, we've got to learn this way. So now, can we take that and run with it and figure out a new model that whenever maybe things are back to normal 100% and you have a choice of being at home or this or that or whatever the case may be, what have we learned and how can we say now education is different because of this and it's different for the better? Because I know this, if we just sit around and, and are frustrated because it's, it's not what we want it to be or whatever, then it's not going to change, you know? Yeah, it's kind of like a bad girlfriend. You know, like I don't know where you you're going with this, but go ahead. <laughs> look, look, look oh, you break oh, up with them, but you keep going back to it because you're familiar with it. Right. The old way was bad, but mm -hmm. and you complained about it, but you're familiar with it, so you constantly want to go back to it. And then once you finally sever the ties, you realize that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't know. Because I, I and I just thought of this. One of the main reasons a lot of teachers are frustrated with it, and Mosley, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit, is that uh, they don't want they don't know how to use technology. There it is, right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, but look, let me tell you what Mosley is doing just fine. I've, 
you know, he's doing just fine with the breakout rooms and, and all of, all of these things. You, and, close your mouth, you close your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that uh, an easy out for teachers when it comes to appropriate assignments is there like, especially when you first learn how to do like whatever it is, your online thing that you're trying to do is like, Oh, awesome. I'm just going to start uploading worksheets and worksheets and worksheets and worksheets. And before you know it, you have the entire semester uploaded on whatever learning platform that you're doing, but you didn't put like when it was visible or something. So a kid goes on there and they have 37 assignments mm -hmm. and it's like, holy crap. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right. So in other words, you just have to be organized and make sure that you're releasing your content in a, in a way that helps students learn. And not that overwhelms them. Is that what you're mm -hmm. saying? Yes. Yeah. Don't front load. You can't front load your assignments. Well, in, in and I don't want to say that you can't do that fully because I, I know the the program that we're using at my school is called Canvas, and you can front load, but but you can control what the student sees. Right. So I have like my next three weeks planned out and it's all on Canvas, but they can only see a day by day assignment of what's coming out. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. That's good advice. So uh, to me, maybe the last thing that I'm thinking about whenever we're talking about appropriate assignments is this. I, I think you've got to kind of think about like your activity stream. Like what are the different activities mm -hmm. that I can do to teach this content? Right. And you kind of have to have a plan of like, you know, I could do a breakout room where we have peer to peer conversation. And then maybe I have this project based activity where the kids are going to collaborate and work together. And then maybe I let them do a writing activity sometimes. So that way they are responsible for communicating that in a narrative style. And then maybe I have something set up where they experiment and they try the activity. So, you know, I have this just stream of activities that are in my pocket. And I think that if you start thinking about how can I come up with a, 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 a uh, like a toolbox of activities and then plug them in in the right places then I think that helps keep your uh, your assignments appropriate because it you just you you want to be careful that you don't see um, a trend happening like you know I I lecture then I give a quiz and then they write a paper mm -hmm. like a f formula because everything. that's not that's not a good user experience right so I've got to I've got to have a time when I'm getting ready to set up my remote learning that I've sat down and I've planned what are some good effective activities and maybe it's not that I use them all in one lesson but maybe it's that I think of the process and then I'm ready to plug them in at the right time so I think that if teachers will think through that process of what makes a good activity and then put it in your back pocket then that's going to help your remote classroom go smoother. Well, this brings us to a good stopping point today. We've discussed the importance of being intentional about your engagement and the importance about creating appropriate online assignments. So in our next episode, we'll be following up with today's episode and we're going to discuss the planning process for remote learning and also how to create effective online assessments. And this is not necessarily what you might think. So you don't want to miss part two. We release a new episode every Monday and Wednesday, so I want to invite you to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, so that you'll get notifications when a new episode releases. Also, check out our YouTube channel called Teach Bigger. We're beginning to create content to help you take your work to the next level. So again, thanks for listening, and we will be back with you next time.